If you read the Gospels, what was the thing that Jesus condemned the most? He spoke against many sins. He spoke against anger and, and unforgiveness and all that. But the one thing he spoke against maximum was hypocrisy. And that's not a word you find much in the Old Testament. I haven't checked it out, but I don't think the word hypocrite is hardly ever found in the Old Testament. But very frequently in the Gospels, when Jesus spoke, he spoke about it so often. Why does it suddenly appear in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew? <clears throat> a word that hardly ever appears from Genesis to Malachi in the Old Testament suddenly appears in Matthew so frequently. That's it. We need to think about that. The word hypocrite is not originally an English word. You know, there are some words in English that have been imported from other languages. And baptism, for example. Baptism just is a Greek word, actually. It's imported into English from the Greek language. All it means is immersion. You dip, you, you, the Greek people would put their hand in a bucket of water and say they baptize their hand in water. That is their language. It's a Greek word. But many people haven't understood it like that. And that's why they sprinkle children and call it baptism. Because they haven't understood the meaning of that word. So hypocrite is a word which means actor. That's the original word in, in the Greek language. You know, if you went to Greece 2,000 years ago and asked, where are all the hypocrites? Let's say in the stage where they are acting. I mean, today, if you ask where are all the hypocrites, you say in the church. But in those days, it was on the stage. They were actors, acting. And whenever we act, that is, whenever you pretend to be something, you're a hypocrite. You're acting. You know, like the Hollywood actor pretending to be a holy person when he's something completely different in his private life. So please remember this. Whenever you act before other people to be more holy than you really are, you are, you are one of those whom Jesus called a hypocrite, an actor. God does not want us to be actors, particularly in uh, Christianity, that we don't pretend to be holier than we really are, it's particularly in relation to our Christian faith and our testimony before others. We don't have to be pretend to be holier than we really are. It's crazy. It's like a, uh, to use an illustration, like a six-year-old boy putting on his dad's trousers and shirt and it looks so odd on him. It's so, so big. He doesn't fit into it. It's ridiculous. That's how a lot of Christians are. They're babies spiritually and they're pretending to be grown-up people. There's nothing wrong in being young and acknowledging you're young. If you ask a child how old he is and he says five, he's honest, he's five. He doesn't have to pretend that he's 25. That's what I mean. And yet Christians always want to give people the impression that I'm a holy person. I'm better than I really am. Because we are afraid that if people did discover what we really are, they won't respect us. They won't appreciate us. Or they won't have anything to do with us. I'll tell you, the Lord will have a lot to do with you if you're honest. And I believe that one of the first, first lessons that we need to learn in the Christian life is what the Bible calls walking in the light. Because in the Old Testament, they never had fellowship with God. They would only hear Moses or Elijah or some prophet, Samuel. They couldn't contact God at all. And when they wanted to know what God was saying, they would ask the prophet, can you please find out what God is saying in this situation? What does God want me to do? And the prophet would pray and tell you what God wanted you to do. The entire Old Testament was like that. Right from Genesis to Malachi, nobody could contact God directly. And this is one of the greatest blessings of the new covenant. That you don't have to go to a prophet or a preacher to find out what God wants you to do. You can 
talk to God directly and he will talk to you directly. He does not talk. He does talk through prophets even today, but he also speaks to you directly. And <clears throat> I want to show you one verse in that connection. If you turn with me to Hebrews in chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8 speaks of the old covenant and the new covenant, or the first covenant and the second covenant. Covenant just means, that's also a big word, I want to explain it, an agreement. You know, we make agreements with people. And uh, it's just an agreement. And sometimes there are written agreements. Sometimes there are spoken agreements. If you do this for me, I'll do this for you. So here's an agreement. The old agreement was, God said, you keep my laws. The laws were not just the Ten Commandments, a whole lot of, there were 613 laws that the Old Testament people had to keep. You read of them in Exodus to Deuteronomy. And uh, it was very difficult even to remember them. That's why had, they had people called scribes who would explain to people what the laws were. But in the new covenant, it says here, he's abolished that old covenant. It's gone. It's just like you folks who are American citizens, you probably know that um, over 200 years ago, in the 1700s, America was ruled by the British people. Great Britain ruled America until America became independent in 1776 and America became, America became a free nation. So something like that happened when Jesus Christ came. He abolished the law under which people were to live and brought us unto a new dominion called grace. The word in the New Testament is grace. The word in the Old Testament is law. So here it says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7, the first covenant of law, if it was perfectly right and without fault, there would be no need for a new covenant. That's the first thing you need to understand. The first covenant was faulty. Not like a car maker that made a faulty car and then improved it in the next version and made a better car. It's not like that. It's not that God made a mistake. See, the law was like a, a mirror that could show you your face, the dirt on your face. Or to use a more modern illustration, the law was like an x-ray or an MRI, a magnetic resonance image of the inside of your body. You know, you go to a hospital and they take an image of the inside of your body with an x-ray machine or an MRI machine, and you can see the bones and you can see so many things inside which you can't see in a mirror. So we can say the law was like a mirror that showed you what was wrong with you or an x-ray showed you what's wrong with you, but the x-ray cannot cure you. It only shows you what's wrong with you. And it's good to know what's wrong with you. And many doctors use x-rays and MRIs to first find out what's wrong. Then he says, now this is what's wrong with you. And now I can treat it. But the x-ray itself can't cure anybody. So the Old Testament was like an x-ray or an MRI showing you what's wrong with you. The law only could show people what is wrong with them. It could not cure anybody. Exactly like an x-ray or an MRI cannot cure anyone. The cure has to got to be with some other treatment. And the cure came through Jesus Christ. So it says here, the first, so the first covenant was faulty. Why? Because it could show people what was wrong with them, but it could not help them to be free from their sin. The law showed people all their sins, not all, at least most of their sins and external ones, and never helped them to be free from them. It could put a fear into people that if you commit murder, you'll be punished. If you commit adultery, you'll be punished. And that fear would keep people from it, but it did not deliver them from that habit. So you see, if they didn't commit adultery on the outside, they committed in their minds, like most men do. But it doesn't deliver them from it. And Jesus came to set people free from it. 